Hello. Hello and welcome to Politics and Prose Bookstore. My name is Olivia Marquis and I'm an event staffer here at Politics and Prose, where we now host virtual events along with partnered and supported events, trips, and classes. For a full list of everything confirmed, please go to our website, politics-prose.com. Before we get started today, I would like to ask you to please silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the event. While we have list lifted the mask mandate here in the store, you're encouraged to you are still encouraged to wear a mask throughout the event, and we have masks located at the front of our store for your convenience. When we get to the portion of the conversation for audience questions, we've, we've placed a standing microphone right at the end of the aisle to your right. Please line up at one of these, or at this mic right here by the podium, or by the pole, I guess, um, so everyone can hear your question as we want that question to be heard in the recording of our event. We are both audio and video recording or live streaming today's program so that you or anyone you know can follow, find it at the Politics and Prose YouTube channel. Following the Q&A, we will have a signing up here at this table. So if you've not already purchased the book, we have many copies behind the registers at the front of the store. We ask you to line up starting here at that pillar right there where the microphone is. And one of our staff can come by and ask you for your name and personalizations. So please have your books ready. Once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs and lean them up against something sturdy, such as one of the bookshelves or the pillars, to help us out a little bit. So now, without further ado, tonight I'm excited to welcome Jonathan Darman, celebrating the release of Becoming FDR, The Personal Crisis That Made a President. Okay. Jonathan Darman is the author of Landslide, LBJ and Ronald Reagan at the Dawn of a New America. He is a former correspondent for Newsweek, where he covered national politics, including John Kerry's and Hillary Clinton's presidential campaigns. Darman will be joined tonight in conversation with Evan Thomas. Thomas is the author of 10 books, including New York Times bestsellers, John Paul Jones, Sea of Thunder, and Being Nixon. Thomas was a writer, correspondent, and editor for 33 years at Time and Newsweek. Please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Jonathan Darman and Evan Thomas. Okay, is Politics and Prose the greatest bookstore there is? Yes! Uh, I'm delighted to be here with, with, with John. Well, I'll, I'll talk to him in a second, but I want to say just a little bit about the book. This is not dry, dusty history. This is really emotional, moving, reach your heart writing. Uh, John is a great writer. We're going to hear more from him. I'm sure of it. But this book is a great book. So tell us, John, how did it, how did it happen? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for all those nice words, Evan. It's, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, and it's wonderful to be here at Politics and Prose. Um, you know, Connecticut Avenue actually looms large in the early chapters of my book, uh, because when the Roosevelts, in their pre-polio pre years, they lived in Washington when Franklin Roosevelt was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And Connecticut Avenue was sort of this grand thoroughfare through their lives that they would traverse when going to very grand uh, social engagements. So it sort of the avenue loomed large in Franklin Roosevelt's early life and career. It also loomed large in my early life and career, um, not because I was going to glittering soirees, but because I was coming to this bookstore. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm very uh, happy to be here with all of you and to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, so the book came about, I guess I should confess that I didn't actually set out to write a book about polio. Um, I thought I was going to write a book about Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. And I wanted to understand, sort of look at the Roosevelt presidency and say, 
How do you, how does a president who's leading the country in the hardest of times form a bond and a connection with the people that he's governing that allows him to get through those tough times and also accomplish big things? Because that's something that has vexed us a lot uh, in recent years. Um, and I thought, um, going into the project at that point, of Franklin Roosevelt as sort of a political natural, someone who was born with all the things you need to be a great president, the sort of easy charm, the effortless skill as a political performer. Um, and I also thought that I would do polio in like half a chapter, because I thought I knew everything that was important about polio, which was chiefly the lengths that he went to to uh, sort of conceal his condition from the public while he was president. I got into the story um, and sort of started researching Franklin Roosevelt's life and tried to get inside of Franklin Roosevelt's head. And I found that the polio story was something that I didn't know and that it was completely surprising and, and really quite moving to me. And that all everything I'd sort of assumed going into this about FDR was wrong in a lot of ways. His greatness was not something that was made. It was something that came to him through the hardest experience of his life, getting polio at the age of 39. And I figured that out um, a bunch of ways. Once, the first and foremost was sort of looking at the pre-polio FDR versus the old FDR after polio. Um, before he had polio, FDR had a whole career in politics. Um, and his uh, sort of persona was being the reincarnation of Teddy Roosevelt, vigorous, athletic young man. He uh, got himself placed on the Democratic ticket uh, in 1920 as the vice presidential candidate, in large part because people liked the way he looked jumping over rows of chairs at the Democratic convention. <laughs> um, and, and he was, that politician was someone who was charming and charismatic, but he was also quite shallow and quite vain and really was someone who might have gotten to the White House someday, but he never would have been a great president. It's only when he gets polio at age 39 and all of his plans for the future are sort of thrown up in the air, his life is upended, that he's forced to become someone else. And I noticed that in the people who knew him best, they all described those years as really the source of everything for him. Louis Howe, who was his chief political advisor and was closest to him, in the, in, the, in the years before polio and after, looked back on the years that FDR spent recovering from polio, and he said, a year or two in bed should be prescribed for all of our statesmen. <laughs> um, and Eleanor Roosevelt talked about, about uh, polio as the years where FDR was forced to learn the fundamentals of living. And those fundamentals of living were really skills that he'd never had before, things like empathy, um, and strategic thinking, which he'd never had before because he'd never needed before. Um, and most important, this sort of genius for inspiring hope, which he would then go on to use when he was leading the, the country through the Depression and World War II. And that all really came home to me, I would say, most clearly as I started reading a lot of letters that people wrote to FDR, other polio patients wrote to him in the years immediately following his diagnosis. Um, so he, his diagnosis gets announced to the public and other people who have polio write letters to Franklin Roosevelt, this very famous man who's gotten polio. And a lot of them are asking for advice about what he did to sort of seek treatment and, and, and pursue recovery. But a lot of them were also offering advice. And there was one man who wrote to FDR and he talked about how he had spent seven years in a hospital recovering from polio and he was still paralyzed. But he described the ways that fear and anger and shame had impeded his recovery. And he wrote and he said, Mr. Roosevelt, whatever you do, don't worry, it won't help any. And I read those words and it sort of opened up my whole book to me because I saw a straight line from those words to the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So, so he's, he's a, a lightweight, a, a feather duster. I love that famous description. I guess the society girls call him a feather duster. Uh, so give, give us the day. Make him sick. Set the scene. So FDR, he was a feather duster. I should, I, I'm going to go back for a second there because he, this is something that I think this audience will appreciate. I heard someone recently talking about a book about contemporary politics, um, and they were describing a certain Washington type, which is someone who is – 
in their late 20s or early 30s and they get a job um, that is pretty impressive sounding or they have a job that's in close proximity to someone who's really impressive sounding and they go crazy in a, in a sort of you know, constrained Washington way because it's the first time in their life that they've ever been cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard that and I thought, that's FDR in Washington before polio. Um, he was the assistant secretary of the Navy and he had never been cool up to that point in his life. He'd gone to Groton and he was smaller and he was sort of a pipsqueak and the other kids bullied him. He went to Harvard and every, he sort of tried too hard in an, in an era where you were supposed to not try at all. He tried too hard to make people like him. And it's only when he gets to Washington that someone like that is fine, sort of their, their milieu. Um, he is, uh, he, people love him because he acts like he's going to be the reincarnation of Teddy Roosevelt. And this is the Wilson administration where everything was, was quite dry and boring. So people liked the idea of a Roosevelt coming in and shaking things up. And he really, um, he's, he's sort of this shallow, um, but you know, successful guy in a lot of ways in those years. Um, and his whole plan up to that point had been to try and be the next Teddy Roosevelt, to sort of follow Teddy Roosevelt's path in politics as closely as he could and, uh, and, 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 and end up in the White House. So when he gets polio in the summer of 1921, He's on Campobello Island, um, in, in, which is a remote Canadian island off the coast of Maine where the Roosevelts have you know, kept a summer cottage for decades. And he, um, you know, he goes to bed one night uh, after a very active day and he's been feeling strange and he, wake, and, he, and he spends a sort of fevered night and it's like his entire body is under attack. Um, and it's, you know, I think of it as sort of, that's August 11th, 1921, and it's not a date that any of us should learn, but it's in a lot of ways one of the most important dates in American history, because I think that's the moment where everything starts for FDR. So there he is, he's lying in bed, he can't walk, he can't move, barely. How does that change his life, and how does that change his thinking and his emotions? It changes him in sort of every way. Um, he's, you know, first of all, it's, it's frightening for him to get, a, he, he, it takes him several weeks to get a good diagnosis. And I, in the book, I describe the sort of drama of that, of finding, being on a remote island and trying to find a doctor who can explain what's happened that's made this man who's been so healthy and vigorous up to that point, lose the ability to walk. And finally, after two and a half weeks, they get the diagnosis of polio, which is in a lot of ways the most frightening diagnosis you could get in that moment because it's a, disease, it's, a, it's a diagnosis that is surrounded in mystery. They really didn't understand very much about the disease at that point, but it was also something that had terrorized people. Um, there had been five years before there had been a New York City epidemic uh, that killed 2,000 people, and, and, and most of them were children. Um, and so FDR gets this, this illness, and I think to his credit, a lot of people, when, when it's announced that he has polio, um, a lot of people write him letters and say, you're the last person we would have thought of as having polio. Um, and that's because it was a disease that was, that was associated with childhood, and it was also a disease that was, that was associated with poor people and with recent immigrants to the United States. And I think that's a moment of decision for FDR in a certain ways, because he could have just sort of leaned into that, and from that point on, just you know, had been a, been an invalid, but not really identify as being someone who has polio. He goes in the opposite direction. He forms this bond with other people who have polio, starting from the earliest days when they're writing him letters. He writes them all back. He tells them uh, specific details about his treatment. He asks them questions. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a change in him, because up to that point, he had been that man that sort of Washington loved before, who was really focused on himself and on looking good and on advancing his own career. It's the first time you really see him in a sustained fashion, thinking about other people and what it must be like for other people who are experiencing suffering. So he had a complicated marriage all the way through. Where's Eleanor in all this? So, I, you know, working on the Eleanor 
parts of this book. She's a, she's a huge character uh, in this story. Um, and, and working on the, the parts of the book that deal with Eleanor's story were, were some of the most fun for me in a lot of ways because her transformation is in a lot of ways more dramatic than Franklin's. Um, when the book starts in the pre-polio years, Eleanor is 35 years old and she's sort of lost. Um, she's had six children, five of whom lived. She is sort of um, deeply unhappy in her marriage because uh, Franklin had famously betrayed her um, by having an affair with her social secretary, Lucy Mercer. And that's this big event for her because it's not just that he's cheating on her, he does it in this very public way um, that leaves her feeling like quite humiliated. And she's this person who's this brilliant woman. She's Teddy Roosevelt's niece and she has all of Teddy Roosevelt's genes or a lot of, all of Teddy Roosevelt's good genes. And, <laughs> and she doesn't really know what her purpose is in life. And she's terrified of the public sphere. There's a moment when Franklin is running before polio, when he's running for vice president in 1920, where a reporter you know, tracks down Eleanor and says to her, what do you think about women's suffrage? Which in 1920 is the big issue of the day. And she says, I, I must say I don't have strong opinions either way. Personally, I'm happy and content with my husband and my children. Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> yeah. you know? And within five years time, she is going to be one of the most consequential women in American politics. She's gonna have an organization and an agenda that is completely independent from her husband's. And she's gonna be writing articles and giving speeches about how women need to be ruthless within the political parties at organizing themselves and demanding that men take them seriously because men are inclined to take them for granted. And it's polio, Franklin's polio, that in a lot of ways brings that transformation about because they need someone with him focused on his recovery and his convalescence to be out there as the public face of the family. And she gets out there and she's a, a bit reluctant at first, but she's always been drawn to this idea of service. And she finds very quickly that the sort of big world of ideas and of action is the place that she was always meant to be. Um, and it's a, it's a very, sort of complex and interesting story in a lot of ways because you see them not just both changing as people, but you see them renegotiating their partnership, which had been broken into a new and very different kind of marriage that is gonna be based upon their shared you know, passion for serving other people and their shared ability to remake themselves in the middle of life. Now, it's, it's not, because, as these things never are, a completely, you know, it's not a straight line. Uh, Eleanor, you know, to the end of Franklin's life, I think harbored a lot of, of rage toward her husband, um, which in, this, in the book, if you read it well, you, you'll see sort of bubbles up in these delicious moments. Um, and it, it tends to be any moment where, and it, you know, after Franklin returns to politics from his years spent recovering from polio, any moment where his, where his new life is gonna have some kind of incursion on this separate sphere that she's created for himself. So for example, when he returns to politics and wins the governorship of New York in 1928, and he, he wins the governor's race in this sort of big surprise, and it's a big, it's a big night, and the reporter, uh, reporters ask Eleanor how she, how, if she's happy for her husband, and she says, how could I be happy when the rest of the ticket did so poorly? <laughs> <laughs> and they say, well, what do you think this is going to do for your husband? And she says, well, I can't see how he can help but getting fat. <laughs> you know, and, and, that's, and it's, you know, there, it, that sort of plays out again and again. But she always comes around to it because I think she's able to perceive the way that polio changed her husband's character and deepened him as a person and, 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 and made him someone who could really make a big difference in the world in, in, in a unique way. So they're sort of on two tracks. One is... He's keeping his political career alive. It's not gone. He hasn't given up on that. But on the other hand, he's going to Georgia, to Warm Springs, to how to talk about those two tracks that they're on and how they sort of juggle that all the way to the governorship of New York. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty unconventional um, approach to, to winning the, the, the White House is go spend you know, five or six years at a, at a convalescent resort in, in Georgia. And I think, though, it's really the center of everything for FDR. Um, he goes in the fall of 1924 to this place called Warm Springs, Georgia, which, where he's been told about curative waters. 
um, that, that are going to have the ability to potentially give him back the ability to walk. And by that point, he's had, he's had, it's been three years since he got polio, and, and he really needs something miraculous if he wants to walk again. He goes down there, and he gets in the waters, and, he, and they do feel magical. But the first thought that comes into his head after a while these wa this water feels like magic is, it's a shame that it's only for me. And again, it's the beginning of him starting to think about his ability not just to look out for himself, but to, do, but to take his advantages and help other people. And he very quickly starts thinking of Warm Springs as a place where he can take everything that he's learned about what you should do to try and recover from paralysis and use it to help other people. You can see it. I, I would see when I was reading his letters after that first trip there, you know, uh, he, had, he had a young polio survivor who would write him these sort of glum letters about how hard it was for him. And, and Franklin responded by saying, I want you to check out Warm Springs, Georgia. It's this special place. I really think you'd like it down there. And he very quickly starts thinking of himself as the guy who can make Warm Springs into a haven for other polio patients and paralysis survivors. In the 1920s, you know, the Roaring Twenties, when everyone else is sort of spending their money on themselves and finding easy ways to get rich, a lot of Fra Franklin's social acquaintances, he devotes a significant share of his personal net worth to buying Warm Springs. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways is sort of a route for, for, for the, the policies that he's able to, to, to pursue as president um, on behalf of the working people because Warm Springs sort of inoculates him from the from the greedy mania of the 1920s. He's down there thinking about helping people when other people are thinking about helping themselves. And it's really the place where, where he, it, it's the laboratory for everything that he's doing. You can read patients' reports from there that describe, you know, X patient came here, and when they got, when they got here, this muscle was this, this big, now it's this big, this muscle was this big, now it's that big. He could walk 400 steps, now he can walk 1,000 steps. And at the bottom of it, it, the author of the report is Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was that hands-on, and he really took pleasure in other people's progress. Um, and, and that's, I think, the sort of you know, opening up for him of his, of his unique ability to help others. But he's still a politician. He still <laughs> wants to be elected something. He wants to be president. He, wa he wants to be governor, at least. He wants to be president. So how does he do that? Yeah, well, he's lucky to have in his corner um, a sort of unique uh, political operative named Louis Howe. Um, Louis Howe had been in his life since before polio, going back to his days in the New York State Legislature. Um, and Louis Howe had long had this idea that Franklin Roosevelt was going to be president of the United States someday. When FDR gets polio in 1921, um, every, most people around FDR are saying, you know, you should retire, you can live a comfortable life as a country squire. Howe hears the doctors saying to him that FDR's progress in his recovery is going to be really affected by the ability to believe that things are going to get better. So Howe knows that Roosevelt is someone who's long had an ambition of greatness in politics. And he says to him, this is not the end. You're not only going to return to politics someday, you're going to be president in the United States. And we're going to have a multi, multi-year strategy for making it happen. And FDR says, when do we start? Um, and, and, and they pursue it. And I think that, I think that it, having, you know, Louis Howe is this amazing character. A lot of people, uh, you know, in this room I know about political consultants. When, they, when the candidate that they have believed in, something terrible happens to them, they start looking for someone else that they can hitch their, their, their wagon to. Louis Howe moved into Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt's house uh, because he wanted to devote himself 24-7 to the interests of Franklin Roosevelt in all respects, political, personal. Um, and, and I think having him there, um, you know, one thing that polio does for FDR is sort of awaken him to how much he's dependent on other people. He's dependent on Eleanor. And he, and he stops taking her for granted in a way that he always had. He realizes that he depends on, on Louis. And, and, and he sort of puts his faith in this plan. And, and, and Louis tends to the sort of political fires um, while FDR is off pursuing recovery and he's and he's and it's also years where he's watching and waiting and getting a sense of what the opportunity in the moment for him might be. So how's the, the press and the public and the sort of the political world watching all this? What do they make of it? What do they see? What do they understand? This this was something that was really surprising for me because I think again we've all thought always thought about polio as this thing that was not talked about that the you know we everyone knows about it when he was 
there was a sort of understanding with the White House press corps that they wouldn't talk about his disability. And that's partially true later on. But in the 1920s, polio is a big part of Franklin Roosevelt's public identity. Um, it gets announced uh, when he's first diagnosed in 1921 that he has infantile paralysis. Now, it's announced with a lot of um, untrue facts. Um, his doctor is quoted in the New York Times saying, there's no reason that anyone need fear a permanent disability, which anyone who knew the case, including that doctor, knew was, was, was just baloney at that point. But so, they, so they start deceiving people early on. But the story of polio is there all along. And in fact, FDR has a reporter at one point come to Warm Springs. You, some of you may have seen these photos. He takes, they, they take photos of him where you can see his body and the way that it's been transformed and his muscles that are, that are small and depleted. Um, and, and when he d ultimately does make a return to politics in the, in the end of the 1920s, polio is a big part of the story. It's a way of humanizing him. He's been through this ordeal and he's come back from, him, from it. And it's, and it's a big part of the, the FDR persona all the way through until he runs for president in 1932. He, he's such an interesting mix. On the one hand, you write about this idea of hope, which is a word that's incredibly meaningful to FDR. On the other hand, I'm, it, towards the end of the book, uh, Harry Truman is asked about, about FDR. And Truman says, he's a liar. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, he's his vice president. And, and you know, reconciling the guy who believes in hope and faith and the liar is a little tricky. Help, help me here. It's, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, none, the sort of the pleasure, as you know well, of doing this kind of work is none of these things are easy and pat. Um, polio makes him better in any number of ways, as I've been describing. But it also gives him, from the earliest days, this idea that deception is going to be a key political tool of his. They start lying about his condition early on, um, and they go to elaborate lengths uh, to sort of keep the public from seeing. It's not that they don't want people to know that he, that he has polio or even that he's disabled. They don't want them to have images that make him look weak. Um, and so they go, to, they go to elaborate lengths of he's, he's sort of constantly being carried up back staircases um, so that so that people won't see, but it's a high risk endeavor because he's in these crowded spaces, giving political speeches where anyone could sort of bump into him, um, and he sort of gets through that and 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 has this this patience about him. Now, ultimately, it does become part of the conversation when he's running for president in 1932. His opponents, first in the Democratic Party and then in the general election, spread this idea that Roosevelt is sort of incredibly weak and sick. And that he might even have, like, the, they, there's a rumor that goes around that John Nance Garner, who was his vice presidential running mate, uh, only accepted on the ticket because he'd seen a doctor's report that FDR had less than a year to live. Um, and, you know, there's this, there's this sort of terror among political professionals that, about this because this idea that, you know, and this will resonate today, people think the president can't look weak. Um, and, and again, I think the, the, the people who have the most interesting perspective on this in a lot of way are other polio survivors. There's someone who writes an essay uh, in the first days of, of FDR's presidency in 1933 um, who had been a Warm Springs patient. And he's talking about the way that people who, who aren't paralyzed talk about FDR's paralysis and all the things that they don't understand. And he says, perhaps they don't realize that the same paralysis which made us weaker animals has made us stronger men. So he's elected governor of New York. He does fine there. Who wants to stop anybody? And, and the presidency is in, is in sight. Who wants to stop him? How do they try to stop him, and what happens? There's a number of people. So he, he, this, this narrative that they spin about the sort of polio comeback, which is true, and again, is central to his, to his identity, is so successful when he wins the 1928 governor's election that he's automatically, from that point on, the sort of front runner to be the next Democratic candidate for the president of the United States. Um, and there, uh, he, he, it looks pretty good for a while until they get to the Democratic convention. At which point there are all of these sort of big players, William Randolph Hearst, Al Smith, um, men who have known FDR for years. And they all sort of discount him because, again, they knew that playboy, the pre-polio FDR. 
and they think of him as someone who's just got some good PR and he's not up to this. Um, and and they, they, they're they sort of thinking, okay, well, how do we jockey around this? They form, the, it's, it's uh, there are scenes in the book where you see sort of Game of Thrones-like scheming of old, <laughs> old rivals and enemies who come together to try and stop FDR. And FDR has this sort of symphonic understanding of everything that's going on in the party, and you can see him sort of doing exactly what he needs to do to emerge with that nomination. It's a very closely thought thing, but it's, I think, again, a sort of um, sophistication and ele elegance in political strategy that he never would have had in, in the years before polio. So he's elected. How does, how does his polio experience inform his presidency? So after I'd done all of this work on polio, I went back to what I had sort of originally set out to do and look at the presidency um, and see, you know, look for traces of polio. And on the sort of surface level, it's really hard to find. He goes back after the 100 days in 1933. He goes back to Campobello for the first time since he had gotten sick in 1921. And that's obviously a sort of you know intentional move and a, and a, and a very sort of um, emotionally freighted moment for him. He goes, he arrives on Campobello, and he says, I have been coming to, I started coming to this island when I was teething, and I went every year for many decades until 1921. Since then, there has been a gap. And then that's it. That's all he says about, about you know, the experience on Campobello and what, what this all means to him. And, and there's very few, you know, he does the March of Dimes when he's president. He talks about, about sort of efforts for other, other polio patients. And he, and he draws attention to Warm Springs, but he doesn't ever really talk about what it means for him. There's a moment at the very end after he comes back from Yalta where he's addressing the Senate, and he says, you'll excuse me for not standing, um, it, because he's so wiped out and exhausted at that point, and he's months, weeks away from death. But that's, a, again, about as close as you're going to get to any acknowledgment of what's happening to him, because, because he, doesn't, he didn't talk about it. But when you sort of know about everything he got from polio, I saw it in every moment in a lot of ways um, in the Roosevelt presidency. I saw it in the fireside chats. Um, you know, the fireside chats, when I went back and looked at them, they're, they're not soaring oratory. They're quite dense and detailed. And I think that's a key insight that comes from someone who's experienced any kind of crisis. A lot of us, anyone who's had a medical crisis or had a family member who's had a medical crisis, when the doctors come in and telling, telling you what's wrong, you want all those details. You don't say, this is boring me. I don't need all of this. You know. And he's, he's giving this very sort of detailed explanation that people can follow because he knows that people will get confidence from that. It's sort of, um, you see it in the New Deal programs. Um, he is, he's applying a lot of these lessons that he's learned from Warm Springs about the things that people need when they're trying to, when they're trying to recover. They need hope, but they also need um, people catering to their dignity, and they need people ca catering to their sense of community, which if you look at a lot of the, the New Deal programs, that's, that's really the biggest objective of them in a lot of ways, is get people working, but get them working in a way that gives them dignity and, and helps them form bonds with other people. And you see it in the, in the war. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt talked about uh, polio as giving FDR the ability to p draw a curtain, make a decision, draw a curtain, and go to sleep. Um, and, I, and he needed that when he was recovering from polio because he would sort of commit to these rehabilitative plans that would, that would take months or even years before he would know if they were going to work or not. And he had to be okay with that. And he had to be okay from the whole experience with knowing that there were things that he didn't understand and that there was a plan for him that he didn't understand. And when you look at the sort of patience and the persistence of FDR's decision making in World War II, I think you see that ability to sort of draw the curtain and go to sleep. Uh, I'm tempted to ask you about, uh, reply this to today, but I think I will open it up to the audience because I think so they'll want to know too. So there's a microphone right there. If you got a question for uh, John, come on up and ask it. Don't be shy. <laughs> so, polio was not his first bout of serious illness. 
Yeah. He was almost ki almost killed by the 1918 pandemic. His mother brought him back to health, apparently. Took him off the ship because he got sick on the ship coming back from, from Europe after he had inspected the naval facilities in Europe. Came back, carried off on a stretcher to his mother's apartment, and they thought it, he might die then. How did that inform his, his next illness with polio? Yeah, um, people say about FDR, the, the pre-polio FDR, that he caught every cold. Um, and he, uh, he had, in spite of this sort of cultivated image of athletic ease and, and, and vigor, he was quite, he was a sickly guy. Um, and that was in part because he had grown up in this rarefied atmosphere in, Hi in Hyde Park, um, the, the Roosevelt family estate, where he was isolated from other children. So he didn't get childhood illnesses and didn't have an immune system that sort of um, would have, was, was trained for things. So yes, he, he, um, he, he went to Europe uh, in, the, in the last days of World War I and, and he got um, influenza and he got double pneumonia. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a, a lot that happens from that trip. That's also the moment when getting off of that, of, uh, he, he, he comes back from Europe and he's, and he's gravely, as you say, ill. Um, and he's taken back to um, Eleanor's, uh, to Sarah, his mother, Sarah Roosevelt's house in New York. And Eleanor is there and she's unpacking his bags and she finds all of his love letters to and to, to, from Lucy Mercer. Um, and that's the moment where she sort of has the proof uh, that, that, she, that he's been cheating on her. And you can tell, she doesn't obviously talk about this publish, uh, publicly, but years later she'll write in her memoir talking about the episode of seeing Franklin when he comes back from it. She says, he didn't seem quite as ill to me as I'd been led to believe. <laughs> uh, and, um, but I think, you know, I think it's, it's um, he, get, he gets polio as an adult um, three years after that. Um, and there's, there's polio for most people who get it um, is, is not a serious infection. This is something we know now, they didn't know then, that most people get it as sort of a digestive ailment and you have uh, flu-like symptoms. And particularly adults generally don't get that sick. And there are a number of reasons why FDR might have been the small, the small minority who got, who got gravely ill and, and became paralyzed. But one of them was his body was still in recovery from that from that illness. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions on my mind that I'd like to ask and see if you want to answer either or both. Okay. Um, you mentioned that Eleanor became a big um, player in this story, and earlier in FDR and uh, Eleanor's life, TR was a big presence. He was a big presence at their wedding and. Yeah. Um, FDR modeled himself on TR in a lot of ways. So if TR had still been alive with when FDR got sick, what impact on the story do you think that would have had, if you want to speculate? And then also I was wondering if there's any fact that you uncovered in preparing your book that no one had uncovered or reported before that you had think has a big effect on the story. Well, I would say on, on that point, for me, it's it's it was really. Uh, other people have looked at this, but I think I think the revelations of looking at those letters from other polio survivors um, was was really the the key insight because you could see in that back and forth with them, um, for me at least, a whole side of him that I hadn't that I hadn't known about before, an ability to sort of identify with. With people that he, the, it's the beginning of this great FDR ability to f to find a way to identify with people he's never going to meet, but no, but make them feel like they know him. Um, on TR, um, it's a it's an interesting qu hypothetical if TR had still been alive. I think of it sort of in the opposite way. TR had died in 1919, and he had been this sort of great idol for Franklin Roosevelt up to that point. And I describe in the book how sort of you know TR's death happens. Teddy Roosevelt's death happens, and it's almost sort of the moment that Franklin thinks, okay, I'm next. Now I'm the next Roosevelt who's gonna step into this. And that's, I think, why when you try and imagine what it would have been like for him to get, to feel his body under attack in the summer of 1921 and be facing down the prospect of paralysis, 
what must that have been like for him? Because all of a sudden, this whole plan for his life, which was to be the next Teddy Roosevelt, and to use his sort of athletic bearing and his, and his appearance to achieve great things, gets taken away from him. Um, and that's, that's really where, where, where I, I think about Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt looms very large in Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt's lives um, and in their minds. But that's where I think of him uh, most, most prominently in this story, is it's everything that Franklin is losing in that moment. Jean? Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about his childhood. Yeah. He, um, as you described him, he was very much of a misfit, kind of detached, negative, and maybe depressed sounding. And um, he, he didn't uh, show that strain when he got the polio. He was pretty good. But did he ever um, relapse? Like, for example, during the war, did he ever kind of self-doubt himself and maybe get a little depressed over it? Or was he fine? ever since that little foray? The answer is, and, and, and you're very smart to ask about this in relation to childhood, because I think it's where, where the roots of all of this are. Mm -hmm. He, Franklin Roosevelt, is raised in Hyde Park under this sort of um, adoring, omnipresent gaze of his mother, Sarah. She was what we would now call a helicopter parent a century before the helicopter parents. Um, and, that, and in a way that was uncommon for women of her class in that time, she didn't want to sort of farm her, her child rearing off to governesses and nannies. She wanted him, she wanted him for herself. Um, and she sort of prided herself on how wonderful he was. And she had really no rules for his upbringing except that he be pleasant at all times. Um, and that causes him to sort of learn very early on that when he's unhappy or when he's, when he's about to become unpleasant or when he, and when he senses that other people think he's becoming unpleasant, he needs to make a rapid correction. Um, and that's really, I think, the root of a lot of Franklin Roosevelt's behavior. He has this sort of this facade that he's able to project, project to the world. Um, Robert E. Sherwood, who was a Roosevelt speechwriter, a playwright, and later a Roosevelt biographer, I think wonderfully described Roosevelt's life as this, uh, in, ro described Roosevelt's thickly forested interior. So if he was depressed, um, if he was you know, dragged down during the war, you didn't really see it, because that was his oldest instinct, was to hide what he was feeling inside. And I think, again, that was really what was sort of moving for me about reading his correspondence with other polio patients was because he was able to be honest and frank with them about his condition in a way that he wasn't even with, the mo with other people in his life who he knew quite well. Um, in, in, at the same time as he's writing these letters where he's describing what he's going through, um, to polio patients, he's, he's writing letters to all his friends where he's saying, I'm gonna be up and walking in months, everything's fine. Um, and he's, he's, not, he's not revealing. And it's really this, this rare moment um, where a window through into his into his inner life that you don't really get at any other point. Mm -hmm. Was he able to reveal that to Lucy Mercer, and not his wife? An interesting thing about Franklin and Ellen, uh, Franklin and Franklin's relationship with Lucy Mercer mm -hmm. is most of what we know about it comes from a couple of sources. One is the letters that that Franklin wrote to Eleanor uh, when he was having an, an affair with Lucy here in Washington in the summer while she was off with the, while Eleanor was off with the children on Campobello. Uh, another one is uh, Eleanor's cousin and Franklin's uh, distant cousin, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, who was a nasty and, <laughs> uh, and, and somewhat unreliable source. And the other is things that Eleanor told her friend and biographer, Joseph Lash. So most of what we know uh, about Franklin and Roosevelt's relationship with Lucy Mercer um, has, a, has a sort of Eleanor bias in a lot of ways. So we don't really know too much about what he was able to show to her, but, I, but you know, when, when, when you look at them in the later years of his life, when she's visiting him um, sort of covertly during, during the war, it's not intense emotional revelation. It's, it's pleasant fun, which he wasn't able to get from Eleanor, and he always needed someone in his life that could give him that kind of release. Thank you so much. Yeah. Where, where would Franklin Roosevelt have been without Eleanor? I mean, in particular, with respect to a lot of the programs under the New Deal, over which she had 
so much of an influence against at least what I've read some resistance on his part yeah um, I mean I, I think it's impossible you know my book is about um, about FDR but she's such a huge I don't I don't know about I don't know if there's any period um, in their in their marriage where she's not going to be a, an essential and central character because she is so essential to everything that he achieves um, as as president and she did play this role um, as conscience for him in a lot of ways and you see it I mean it, it plays itself out a lot in the in the presidency but you see it happening in these years too she's she's taking a lot more sort of radical positions in him and she's able to sort of point out the sort of sizable gaps in his compassion so even in warm springs which is the site of so much wonderful growth for him it's also unfortunately the segregated south in the 1920s and the first time they go down there um, they're being they're being driven around um, and they're and they're shown a, a nice school for white children and Eleanor's first question is where's the school for the black children what, what what how are they being educated and Franklin wasn't thinking in those terms and and we see that play out over the course of the presidency where, where she's she's a voice for sort of getting out in front on civil rights in a way that he doesn't it's a it's an unfortunate theme here um, because the Democratic Party that he's that he's focused on making his return to in, in politics in the 1920s is dominated by southern segregationists and he's and he's very concerned he's he's a pragmatic guy and he's concerned about doing anything that's going to lose their support and Eleanor is always making sort of trying to push that envelope with him but she also knows um, on other issues she's uh, she's constantly disappointed with him um, that he's not that he's not doing enough but she knows she's she's not a sort of you know idealist who doesn't understand pragmatic politics that's you see her in this book as a sort of political organizer in her in, in her own right who's very focused on how do we win the votes and that's true of a lot of that early gener generation of women political organizers in the Democratic Party and it was it was really fun for me to, to learn about how they all did that um, you paint a picture of America in the late 20s and early 30s that sounds sort of eerily familiar. A rise of white nationalists, the Klan is all over the place. Uh, big immigration resentments. Uh, William Randolph Hearst invents the slogan, America first. Uh, you know, it just, Father Coughlin could be on Fox today. Uh, it, it just, there's a, and then of course the Great Depression isolationism, all these things feel eerily familiar. So if you can, this is very counterfactual, but how, you know, what can we learn from FDR about our own situation yeah. today? Um, you know, I was, I was working on and finishing this book during the pandemic and during the 2020 election and its aftermath. Um, and I came back a lot, um, just for my own sake, to a quote that FDR said uh, when he was when he was running for president in 1932, darkest days of the depression, um, and he and he and he said he said in out of every crisis, mankind rises with some share of greater knowledge, of higher decency, and of purer purpose. And I would read those words, you know, after January 6th, and think, gosh, I hope that's true. Because <laughs> uh, it's 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 hard for a lot of us to see it, you know, right now. Where the, where is the greater knowledge and where is the purer purpose and how do we find that? But FDR was able to say that in America in 1932, um, where you know, in a lot of ways, the the republic was facing even more peril than 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 it might be today. And he was able, and he said it, and people believed it, and they believed it because he believed it, and he believed it because he had found it in his own life. So I would say the biggest thing that I learned from this was, or the way that this made me change, the, the biggest change in my thinking about contemporary politics was the way that we should assess politicians who talk about hope. Hope is a word that, that gets used so frequently in our politics now that it's become totally meaningless, but it's the thing that we all need. And so when we hear politicians talking about hope, I think FDR's story shows us we should say, when was a time in their life when they needed hope, and what did they learn from that? Thanks, John.